of the Social Sciences Network and the Economics Department. So it's a great pleasure for us in Western Australia to welcome Alex Milmau from Federation University in Victoria. Um, Alex is going to be talking about this. This is his, his book on the Gypsy Economist, The Life and Times of Colin Clark. Alex is a um, well-known historian of economics in Australia. He's been the president of the History of Economic Thought Society of Australia for more than years than I care to remember, quite a long time. His uh, last book was A History of Australasian Economic Thought, which was a very nice book. And prior to that, he did work on the power of economic ideas, looking at macroeconomic management in Australia. So it's a, it's a pleasure, Alex, to have you uh, as part of this seminar, and I'm, we're now in your hands. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Okay, um, I'll run the commentary using the slides. Um, take about 40, 50 minutes to do this one. So let's go to the first slide. I want to present this uh, presentation by placing Colin Clark amidst the Australian economics profession. Um, but I also want to have a look at Clark for the reviewers that have come in of my book um, and uh, if I've come up unearthed any new in additional information on Clark since I've written the book. There's been a few snippets, a few little clues. Um, when Clark uh, first came to Australia way back in 1937, he was very impressed with Australian economists for the way they taught their economics with due regard to the observed facts. The only other country he liked the economists of was in Sweden. He, so both Sweden and Australia were, were teaching economics the way he would have liked it to be taught. Um, and when he came to Australia, unfortunately, he had some sort of personal or spiritual crisis, uh, which led to him actually moving away from the people that had welcomed him to Australia. Um, and so what followed from that was some 30 years of, of, of looking upon Clark, the, the Australian economic profession looked upon Clark as some sort of a, an oddball, a maverick, a gypsy economist, um, a bit weird, uh, even to the extent where some of his lectures apparently were boycotted by local Australian economists when he, was, when he came back here on a short sabbatical in 1967. Um, towards the end of Clark's life, though, the Economic Society of Australia, ESA, recognising his genius, moved to honour his contributions to economics. And so what happened was that in 1987, the Economic Society of Australia, uh, which had been around since 1925, um, they decided to introduce a Distinguished Fellow Award, just like the Royal Economic Society and the American Economic Association, and I'm sure the Japanese Society. Um, to recognize eminent Australian economic talent. And it was decided that they would make the award, the first award to two distinguished Australian economists, Trevor Swan, the growth theorist, and Colin Clark, both of whom probably should have had a share in the Nobel Prize in the past in respect of their academic contributions in quite different fields. So the Economic Society of Australia decided to make them the inaugural recipients. However, there was a slight technical problem both men in 1987 were elderly, in ill, in Ill, Ill health. Clark had Parkinson's disease at this stage and had clashed at an earlier conference. Moreover, Swan, Trevor Swan, had apparently been in a huff with Clark about his pro-population views, his, um, his uh, Catholicism, his um, pro being a proponent of rapidly, rapid population growth and not being... Uh, at all worried about it. Clark, uh, Swan had apparently resigned in protest when Clark was made a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in 1970. So there's a little bit of history between those two men. However, he, we went to the presentation in 1987. Um, I think, I don't know where it was. I, mean, I think, yeah, it was up in Queensland. It was on the Gold Coast. I didn't go to the conference that year. Uh, but I did go to regularly to the conference, but not that year. I wish I had, obviously, because there was another problem at the conference dinner where they were going to make the award. The, the person who was going to make the award was the Australian Prime Minister, Bob Hawke. And there was a bit of history between Bob Hawke and Colin Clark. In, in the 1950s, when Bob Hawke, as a young Australian, fairly strong-willed economist, quite 
and, and, and quite antagonistic, I might say. When he went to Oxford, Clark was going to supervise him in writing a thesis upon Australia's wage arbitration system, wage determination system. Uh, but when Clark had a look at some early drafts, he decided that this wasn't pure economics and it would be no good to him or no good to Oxford University. Well, obviously, Hawke, being very feisty and aggressive, was very upset and he took his work to another supervisor. But he never he never forgave Clark for that, um, that insult. Uh, and in fact, when Clark and Hawke ran into a, a conference in 1962 in Canberra, Again, there was a bit of a verbal clash. You can read about this in, in the, the book that came out of that conference. It was on Australia's economic prospects. And recently, just a few months ago, I was going through the Garno papers up in the up in the State Library in, New, in State Library in New South Wales, up in Sydney. And I was looking through the Garno papers. There's only three boxes. And Garno had referred to an incident at Monash in 1970 when Bob Hawke came, came along to give a seminar. And he saw Colin Clark in the audience and he went crazy. I mean, you, you know, he, he lost his track and because the two of them were vehemently opposed to each other. Well, particularly, particularly Hawk, he felt he'd been dudded by Clark. So I, that's a little revelation that I wish I, I could have put into the book, but I only just discovered it a few weeks ago. So what then if Clark and Swan both, both ill turned up for the ceremony? Well, uh, it seemed as if the thing went okay that we were spared embarrassment. Clark uh, appeared. I don't know about Trevor Swan. Bob Hawke, who was then prime minister in 1987, was in a forgiving mood, and he actually paid a small tribute to Colin Clark, which was later published. Clark, actually, Bob Hawke was quite a fairly reasonable economist. He had a number of papers produced in Australian economic journals, so he wasn't a complete economic drongo, is what uh, Clark called him. Drongo means dope or dull person or dullard. The award to Clark, which he cherished, was perhaps some atonement or some reconciliation for how Australian economists had treated him in the past. Because in the 50s and the 60s, Colin Clark was basically treated as, as a mad prophet, crazy, overly Catholic, anti-woman, uh, completely against the Australian economic consensus. Both Clark and Swan died two years later. Anyway, why did I decide to write a book on Colin Clark? Well, I probably it's probably because all his papers are basically up at University of Queensland in Brisbane, where I used to have lunch with Bruce Littleboy when I would go up there uh, and spend a day and a night there. Um, but he basically Colin Clark, the reviewers that I'll talk about in a minute, basically he's an almost forgotten figure, obscure. Uh, that's the general reaction of my reviewers, including uh, one a journalist and uh, the reviewers. The, the thing about Clark was I had a little personal connection with Clark because when I was a schoolboy and not a very good schoolboy, not very clever, a bit of a dope, bit of a class idiot, Clark came to my school, Mazenod College, which is a Catholic school, a Catholic boys' school, and uh, I was sort of smirking and laughing at his accent and this strange look. And uh, so he was the first economist I actually ever saw in person. The reason why Clark came to my school was to actually tell these Catholic teenagers not to be worried about the current future, not to be worried about overpopulation, the population bomb, uh, the Club of Rome, environmental doom, running out of resources, etc. I, re I distinctly remember the books I was reading in Form Free English was... Only One F by René Dubois and The Population Bomb by Paul Ehrlich. It was a pretty dreary and depressing reading for a 15-year-old schoolboy to be reading that sort of stuff. In fact, I, I don't think I actually read it very well. I was a very poor student, you know, as were most of my colleagues. We, weren't re we didn't really take it on board how depressing this literature was, this doom-laden doom literature was. Anyway... That got me thinking, maybe I should do something on Clark. The fact that his papers were up in Queensland, the fact that no one had written much about him, uh, the fact that I it was the first economist I ever saw. So I decided, all oh, right, well, I'll do Clark. Um, so briefly, Clark was, um, I've described him as an Anglo-Australian economist, but in fact, he's actually had a Scottish heritage. His father was a, a Scot. His father had made a fortune in the meat export business in Queensland as a young man. Clark himself, 
uh, trained as a chemist at Oxford, a bit like Margaret Thatcher. But he, he in a, as a young man, he was a, quite a, a radical socialist, a Fabian socialist. And he wandered into the economics classes. He used to audit the classes of Lionel Robbins. And he, he did, without having an economics degree, he never had an economics degree, by the way, Clark. It was always chemistry. So, and it, but what the chemistry had given him, though, was an excellent knowledge of statistics. And everywhere he would go, he would always carry this little slide rule. So he was really a mathematical wizard, a statistical wizard. And so he also developed useful mentors, including Rhino Robbins, Hugh Dalton, who was an economist and then a politician, GDH Cole, Clement Attlee, the British Labour leader, who was a secretary to, would you believe, and Keynes. His statistical prowess led to his first publication, looking at unemployment in, in interwar Britain in 1928. But he was already regarded as a wizard with stats. And that's the thing that opened doors for him. Uh, a prowess is not with numbers, as someone said, one of my reviews said. He was a hired as a young man as a statistical advisor to the Economic Advisory Council, which was set up by the British Labour government in 1930 as a way for economists to try and formulate solutions to the Great Depression. And there he saw Robbins and Keynes squabble over the economic policy, over free trade versus protectionism. Eventually, he resigned from the EAC, depressed about it all. P apparently, the, the prime minister at the time had wanted him to write a protectionist manifesto. Even at that time, Colin Clark had absorbed free trade. He was a free trade fanatic even then. He was never into protectionism. Keynes, seeing his statistical gifts, hired him very cleverly as a university lecturer at, for Cambridge. And there he began working on national income, et cetera. That was his, um, his foreplay, his, 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 uh, his forte. Um, his, he obviously read the existing literature and tried to give a better estimate of his, his national dividend or national product. Keynes called him a special, a bit of a genius in terms of how he could quantify things. Um, but the key point about Clark, while he was at Cambridge from 1932 to 1937, was he wasn't really part of the Cambridge circus. He wasn't with that group of five economists that discussed the germination, the general theory, you know, Keynes and Caldo, John Robinson, James Mead, etc. cetera. So, but he was Keynes's data man, his numbers man, so to speak. And in 1932, Clark's book, or work on British production data, he derived the concept of GNP, you know, the basic aggregate of national production. It's now been superseded by GDP, but um, that was the first estimate of economic activity in Britain. And the, the idea was that that would give Britain an idea about economic policy and judging, gauging where the economy was. His next major, uh, the thing about that was when, when 1971, when Kuznets was given the Economic Prize for his work on national income and growth, uh, there, there was no sharing with Colin Clark. They obviously dismissed Colin Clark as, a, as, as maybe a part recipient of it. The other book that Clark, is probably his best book, his magnus opus, is The Conditions of Economic Progress, which was written half in England and half in Australia. It came out in 1940 when Clark was up in Queensland working as a public servant. And there Clark looked at, he broadened his study to looking at other countries as much as he could with the data. And he, he, he was qualified as one of the first pioneers of economic development, one of the, develop, one of the pioneers of development economists. And he, in those findings, he had found that the world was fairly poor. There was a gap between rich and poor, et cetera. Heinz Arndt said he was the first economist to recognize a gap between rich and poor. An earlier pamphlet on Soviet economics had found that the Soviet statisticians and economists were basically um, fibbing the statistics to please Uncle Joe Stalin. Clark had found Russia to be a very poor and hungry country uh, with the statisticians fudging the figures. In 1937, Clark was offered a sabbatical in Australia, teaching economics at Melbourne by Douglas Copeland. Copeland had wanted to get Austin Robinson to come out, but he, he was too busy with the Economic Journal. So Clark put his hand up and he got the gig, got the, got the job. 
He probably wanted to come out to Australia because his father had made his fortune there, subsequently lost it. And the idea was that Clark would come to Australia and then he would go back across the Pacific to America to flog another book, which was National Income again. It was a, a, the update of his 1932 book. And he, he would do a lecture tour in America. That was a plan. However, what happened was that he got his gig at, at Melbourne under Copeland, and then he got extra. He got another terms teaching at Sydney, and he decided he, he began to um and ah about going across the Pacific. He also got a job at UWA, would you believe, replacing uh, A. G. B. Fisher, who had gone off to London to become a professor there. And his when he was offered the prospect of teaching in UWA, he said it was an opportunity of seeing this rather isolated country with a peculiar set of peculiar set of economic problems all of its own. So he was beginning to fall in love with Australia. And by the summer of 1937-38, when he's got to decide whether he's going to go back, go back to Cambridge and fire America, um, he decides um, um, when a friend comes a visiting that maybe he should stay in Australia for a few more years. He went up to Queensland to see Brigden, who was then the head of the Director of Bureau of Industry. And again, he was impressed by Australia. One reason why he was impressed because he had a very poor upbringing in England. His father had lost a lot of money. And so what, he was a scholarship boy at Winchester. He was a scholarship boy at Cambridge, OK? Um, he, he, uh, he had a fairly poor upbringing, pretty... Uh, I mean, his family was not rich. His father had lost his his wealth. Um, and so when he comes to Australia, he's very much impressed by the space, the resources, the climate, the cheap food, the people, the, how optimistic they are, the classlessness, and, the, and not least, the progressive economic institutions like the arbitration system, the tariff board, well, maybe, maybe not the tariff board, but, and also the economists, the lady teach over here. So he, and the fact is he's going to follow in his father's footsteps. Anyway, what happens is Brigden gets a, a job in Canberra. And so there's a vacancy in Queensland, the, the director of the Bureau of Industry. Um, and so Clark decides to take that job. He's offered it by the premier of Queensland, William Forgan Smith. And in, resign, in resigning from Cambridge, he tells Clark, the Queensland job was such a great chance to put economics into action. And better that than more armchair theorizing. Clark wasn't into theorizing so much. He was more an applied economist. He was into stats and testing hypotheses and theses. He wasn't a theoretician, really. OK, that decision, that critical decision in his life, which he made in January 1938, was swayed by a visiting Hugh Dalton, one of his mentors, who was here for the 150th anniversary of the founding of Australia. And it was Dalton that perhaps put that thought on his head. Why don't you stay in Australia for a few years just to, to, to learn how to become an excellent applied economist? And he's getting a fabulous salary in the Queensland government. The Queensland government are paying him more than the Premier, actually. So uh, he decides to stay. And in a letter that Dalton later wrote to him, because Dalton didn't know if Clark had actually decided to stay for sure. He, he, Clark was umming and eyeing, and saying, yeah, I'm, I think I will stay. But in a later letter that Dalton writes to Clark when he's heading back to England, he makes six points. He makes six points about why Clark should take this job up in Queensland. And he lays it out in a, in a letter that's in the, the, the Clark papers, which in Brazenose College, Oxford, there are up in University of Queensland, but they're photocopies. It's better to go to the original source, which is in Brazenose, because there you see the letters, you know, the original letter. And Dalton makes six points. Dalton also was blown away by Australia. Dalton's a socialist um, economist. He's written a book on public finance, which is a bestseller. He will become the Chancellor of the Exchequer when the Labour government comes in in 1945. But he makes six points. He just says Queensland is a very interesting place from a, an economic viewpoint uh, of making things happen, you know, which is what Dalton, that was Dalton's motto, making things happen. And the living conditions were much better than smoggy London and the poverty and the poor food, the depressing, dreary, dry place, particularly if you've not got much money. Um, 
the other thing he makes a key point there is that he tells Clapp, you had a most inadequate status at Cambridge. Kane should have done a lot more for you in getting a fellowship than merely treating you as a statistical convenience, which is a very damning statement. But Keynes and Dalton did not get along. So there's a little bit of um, a viciousness there by Dalton about Keynes. The chances of Clark getting into British Labour politics, he'd, he'd ran three times uh, in rural seats and one time in a in a Liverpool seat, and he'd filled all three times. And even Clark was beginning to realise that maybe he wasn't really cut out for politics. And then another thing was to look at how Queensland was engaging in some rudimentary form of economic planning would be good for the British Labour Party when, when Clark decided to return to London. And then the other thing that changed his mind, he had come out here with a, his wife and two young kids, or his, his second children had been second child had been born here. So he already had an Australian in his midst and his family. The prospect of war on Europe was looking very threatening. And last but not least, Dalton felt, look, this is this is your time to make a, a real good career move uh, and to get a lot of money and to kick Cambridge and London in the back of the back of the pants, as it were. So that was Dalton's advice. Dalton was a strong mentor on Clark. But eventually, Clark had to, he was the one that had to make that decision. And he made this decision to resign from Cambridge, to take up this seven year appointment in Brisbane as a director of the Bureau of Industry, and also the state statistician, and also the financial advisor to the Treasury. It was a huge job, but he was getting paid 1,500 pounds, which was way about 500 pounds more than you'd get as a university chair. And he also likes working for his boss, Premier William Forgan Smith, with his much more rustic, ruralist and decentralised outlook. Uh, and in fact, he even praises them in that book, The Conditions of Progress, as a far-seeing patron of economic science. So he obviously gets along well with the Premier. Uh, the, there's no nothing in the data, nothing in the literature, nothing in the archives whether Keynes actually missed Cambridge in England. Um, and I'm saying that's one of the key moments in his life story because the lack of intellectual engagement in Brisbane, which was then just a big country town, there wasn't an intelligentsia there, a very small university uh, of Queensland, one or two economists, maybe only one actually, meant that Brisbane, even though it was a fabulous, fabulous job he had and a fabulous salary, was very much a hardship posting. The weather might have been good, the food might have been good, the space, the easy working conditions. He could actually do his ac could write academic literature while he's doing this, these three jobs as state advisor, state statistician, and advisor to the treasury. Um, he could still work on finishing off the conditions of economic progress. Uh, and he had statistical help, obviously. But I argue in my book that this loss of one's moorings and one's friends and one associates the Fabian Circle, the Labour Party people, people at Cambridge, that working in that isolated remote place of Brisbane with no air conditioning, very high humidity in the summer, obviously oppressive, though apparently Clark seemed to write the warm weather, might have led to a significant break in Clark's life. And in 1940, he stuns his wife and his friends, colleagues, Australian colleagues, Australian economists, by becoming a Roman Catholic. And in doing so, also dropping his early beliefs in Fabian socialism. He you now dabbled in distributism, which is a romanticized economic set of beliefs that favor decentralization, widespread distribution of property, rural development, and, and placing curbs on cities. He had been early exposed to the works of Hilaire, Billock, and Chesterton. But now he really took them up with a passion. So I argue here, was, it was, was Brisbane a, a wrong turning for Clark? Well, it was in some respects because he was basically removing himself from the transatlantic economic profession, Britain and America. Australia was still very much an isolated outpost. So he becomes a new man, a new economist. Not only does he become uh, drop socialism and his colleagues, but he also finds a new friend in B.A. Santa Maria, who's a Catholic uh, ideologue, a conservative who teaches Catholic teaching. And um, Clark is obviously uh, into this rural 
distributive outlook thing, which Santa Maria is also professing, you know, opposing industrialization, opposing urbanization, etc., centralization too. And centralization was becomes his key um, model, I suppose. He wants, he believes that centralization will reduce the cent will, decentralization will fight against the centralization of power of Canberra. In 1942, for instance, Canberra adopted universal taxation. They took it off the states. And of course, William Forgan Smith resigned in protest and actually no longer wanted to be premier. But that was the way it was going, right, to fight the war. Uh, so Clark is already against Canberra. He's against centralization. He's against uh, the Commonwealth taking more and more economic power from the states. He's a statesman in a way. He's he wants to support the states rather than the federal government or, or Australia. Um, these positions distance Clark from his economic colleague professions. They already regard him as a strange person. Um, in fact. Um, Someone said he may have gone a bit mad here, but he's still publishing. Um, he's still publishing. And in 1930, 40, 45, he publishes one of his more famous articles about the 25% law, saying that um, on empirical grounds, if you raise taxation higher than 25% of GDP, you will, invent, you will eventually encounter inflation. And this paper was actually came from one of this, one of the another Queensland Premier, a chap called Hanlon. The successor to William Forgan Smith, who, who said, "Look, this excessive taxation. Uh, how, how, how are we going to pay for all this welfare state, all this post-war welfare state, etc., by raising taxation?" And he felt that that would lead to, you know, like uh, like like uh, in Rome, you know, the ancient Rome had been destroyed by high taxation. So Clark goes and tests this proposition, and he comes up with this twenty-five percent ruling, which even Ronald Reagan eventually used and vote uh, way back in the nineteen eighties. And Clark always claimed that Keynes supported this contentional law, this empirical relationship, though, as I said, Clark, as we know, Keynes would change his mind when conditions changed. But Clark always brandished this letter saying that Keynes suspected Clark was probably right about the 25%. So if you have more social welfare, you know, cradle to grave welfare system, you're going to have high taxation and that will lead to inflation, etc. So that's a very that article was published in the Economic Journal, and even then Clark is now becoming even more extreme. He's now adopting a more supply side proto neoliberal approach. He believes that welfare and health should all and education should be, be done by yourself. There should be minimal taxation. People should prepare their own pension, their own welfare using savings. If we shouldn't have camera doing offs. And so he's a, he's opposed to centralization. He still believes in free trade, one of the great consistencies in his career. And he curses Australia's obsession with post-war industrialization that we have to defend ourselves. We have to produce everything with high tariffs. He's also, Clark's also wary about over full employment, uh, which is where there's more jobs than there are people, which actually Copeland also shares that idea because of again, the fear of inflation and over-regulation. Clark now pushing the idea that the domestic population growth is too much focused on urban areas and we need to decentralize it, we need to spread it out, land, sort of, land settlement. And that's why he moved to Queensland in the first case. He liked what Pre Premier Forgan Smith was talking about, that we should spread the population out from more out from Brisbane into the hinterland. Uh, it never happened. The shows are still a very urban, very urbanized city, even to an urban, urbanized country, even today. In fact, one of the most urbanized countries. Melbourne, Perth, Brisbane, Sydney, etc. Um, the reason why Clark pushed that line, apart from a better spatial distribution, was he felt that big cities were polluted, where the, the crime would go up, the closeness would make living standards poor. He, he wanted to spread out. Now, if you actually, when you ever, when you come to show, you can see how he may have a point because. Most of the hinterland is actually empty in Australia, and it's all beautiful country, not the desert. I'm talking about the, the eastern seaboard, the south, and WA, the, the part where before you come desert. It's basically isolated. It's, it's, it's deserted. It's empty. And, you know, he, he might have been taken away, blown away by the space of Australia, Clark, and this, this view of, you know, that we're all concentrated in big cities like Brisbane. Look at Brisbane today, for instance. 
or even Perth, huge skyscrapers concentrated in Melbourne, students over, you know, very noisy. This is not, this was not Clark's view of life. He wanted people to spread out. Um, and, the, and the other thing about Clark, though, was that basic faith in free trade. He felt that Australia's economic destiny was rural development, primary goods, not minerals. He doesn't talk much about minerals because we didn't, we had gold and we had some coal, but he basically sees Australia as an agrarian exporting country, right? And the primary role in the global economy would be to feed the world. And most of the people would also be working in services. So a service exporting country, but also basically a primary exporting country. That was Australia's economic destiny. Well, most of his colleagues were up in arms about this. And when he goes on radio one day talking about population control uh, and, and, and birth control and how he's totally against it, the, the producer of the program says that Clark's gone crazy. You know, he, he, he writes him a very strong worded letter saying, what's happened to you when, since you've gone up to Brisbane? You've gone crazy. What's the weather done to you? You've gone tropical, which is an extreme expression for having gone mad. The weather's affected your, your, your mind. And the, the Australian economists felt the same way, I suspect. Anyway, what happens is that eventually Premier Hamlin goes and then the next Queensland Premier is very much against that rural vision. He he's wants to Brisbane to, in fact, become more bigger and to engage in manufacturing. And this is anathema to Clark. So he resigns his job. And he resigns his job when he's, got, he's now got eight children, eight boys. And then he's going to have another child when he's over in England, a girl. Eight boys, one girl, a huge family. He's obviously into population growth personally. Uh, uh, you know, he's not just an armchair uh, theorist, right? So he, 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 he sensation resigns from the Queensland government in 1952. And for a year, he does a bit of economic journalism and a bit of forecasting, but he's looking for another job. Um, and uh, he eventually gets a job but he's, it's not in Australia, it's in, back in England. He's reluctant to leave Australia, quite markedly reluctant, because it's a hell of a job to transport your family all the way back to England. Then it would be by ship. Um, but he, in his last farewell before he heads off, he says Australia has gone off track. You know, uh, no one wanted to listen to him. No one wanted to employ him. None of the universities offered him anything. He was signed out for the Giblin chair, but they just dismissed him. And one of the reasons why they dismissed him is probably because he was a Catholic, and not just a Catholic, but the, with the zealotry of a convert. All right, so he he leaves Australia, and he goes back to Oxford. Oxford offers him a job as the Director of Agricultural Economics Research, which is partly in his calling. Uh, so he moves there, and he takes up an interest in farm economics, development economics, even develops an econometric model of the American economy, which means he has to fly to America and he makes quite a bit of money. Clark's into very much making a lot of money. Why? Because he has to pay school fees for eight kids and his wife. Uh, and so he's always trying to make money consultancy. He's one of the early globe-tropping economists. You know, he's looking for work, selling this uh, econometric economic forecasting model to American corporations, which I didn't find much of. But he certainly makes some money there. But he's now back in Oxford, his old uh, home, or his, his uh, alma mater. Uh, and in Oxford, he now begins to, apart from the, the, the dreary work for agricultural economics, he now begins to take on the new big causes. And the, the, the first one that comes around is the fear of running out of resources and over, overpopulation growth and all this sort of stuff, you know, and limited supplies. He believes from the very start, he's always an, always been an optimist, Clark, by nature. He believes the world's got enough capacity, enough food to, to feed a greater population. At that time, the, pop, the global population was about three or four billion, right? And so he starts to take on the FAO who had made out this terrible dire prophecy that two thirds of the world's population was suffering from malnutrition. He actually shows empirically that that's false. And in fact, they actually, eventually after a long battle, they recant, they actually say, Clark is right. But it took a long time for them to recant. But now he's bu building the case 
uh, he's building a case against creative population control. He believes we should just have more people. OK, um, this argument does not derive from his Catholicism, because I found out in writing this book that his opposition to Malfusionism had had been given or had originated in a paper he gave in 1933, where he was very suspicious of Malthus's uh, geometrics or his mathematics or his arithmetic. Uh, and so it wasn't because he was a Catholic for that obviously helped, but his fierce opposition to birth control um, was already planted there. And he, he obviously he decided to do this, follow his own words and having a large family. So he very much is against the Malfusion inspectors. They all found that food production was, in fact, you could ramp it up. Uh, and in fact, that population growth was a net economic positive. And I think Redaway and Keynes had also suddenly adopted that line in 1937-38. And he, he always said that countries that had practiced birth control because of this fear of running out of resources and overpopulation, like France, had declined as a nation, had been, become enfeebled as a nation. So this anti-Malfusionism did actually stem from his early years. It wasn't from his Catholic faith. It was in 1933 he first gave a paper getting stuck into Malthus. But even when he's at Oxford, though, Clark is still angling to get back to Australia. So he did actually have a great love of Australia, the Australian lifestyle. I don't blame him. Even though he had a fairly good job at Oxford, and he, he was quite fond of English literature. He used to go around the countryside and walks with his sons, I mean, he was, uh, you know, proud of his English and Scottish heritage. And he obviously, obviously liked the English countryside. Um, but he did go for five jobs in Australia, but he failed in all five of them. They were all, all fairly high level jobs, like vice chancellor at, at, Queensland, at University of Queensland. Another one was a, the inaugural dean of the Faculty of Commerce at Monash, uh, a chair at University of Sydney. Uh, but these all failed, and he begins to fear that Australia has turned its back on him. He actually has a, a, a newspaper article about this when he complains to an Australian correspondent that they've turned against me. And it's perhaps because of his Catholicism, his views on religion, his association with Santa Maria, who was very, very, uh, well, his, his, his a very bad karma with the intellectuals, his, his views on birth control, and not least his views on women in the, in the workforce, which was fairly Edwardian. He was a terrible misogynist, Clark. He a very uh, unenlightened view of women. You know, they should just stay at home and be homemakers. Uh, very, very embarrassing to read that. In a conference in 1962, when Clark comes a visiting, he attacks Australia's level of protectionism and its aversion towards competition. So he's very penetrant, very uh, acute very sharp observations of the Australian economy and again the neglect of agriculture for for industry and why trade deficits would persist and that's where Hop, Bob Hawk gets stuck into him. The reason why Bob Hawk gets stuck into him he says oh look Clark wants to basically make Australia look like a big rural retreat you know with settler farms and a, a sort of a rural utopia which is completely unrealistic to what real Australia was which is an industrialized, centralized, urbanized economy. Uh, only a shift back to agriculture and services would redress Australia's trade problems. And he gets stuck into Australian economists, I've quoted there, the thing that they, they, they uh, had avoided the unpleasant task of having to educate public opinion out of its prejudices. So we can see that Clark was a bit of a seer there because 20 years later, well, based actually 30 years later, Australia did adopt free trade under Paul Keating. We got rid of tariffs. In the 1960s, when Clark's still at Oxford, the Vatican Church comes a calling, or the, the Vatican comes a calling because they want him to be a specialist in writing the or to advisor in writing the papal encyclical Humani Vitae, which is where the Pope Paul VI was, was umming and eyeing about whether we, the Catholic Church should authorize birth control. Eventually, they decide to oppose birth control, and Clark was fingered as one of the people that had pushed that hard line on artificial birth control. Pope Paul VI was, you know, edging a little bit towards contraception, but the hard line has got to him. So I've called that the Vatican economist, um, but he's also still taking on the FAO, the Food and Agriculture. Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, 
on the true extent of world population. And uh, he even, as I said, he basically gets them to recant in 1971. The director of the FEO basically says to him, you're right, that you could bring more land onto con cultivation and more agricultural techniques, fertilizers, et cetera, fertilizers. But I think Clark goes over the top here because later he says that we, the, the F could feed 47 billion. Uh, currently it's at 9 billion and we still have some starvation and some droughts, et cetera, in Africa, et cetera. He also takes to task the Paul Ehrlich, Paul Ehrlich's Population Bomb, which was a book that I had to read at school, which was that classic population doomsday account. Um, and then in 71, he, he doesn't win the um, Nobel Prize with Kuznets. One economist said it was because of Clark's outspoken views on population growth. And then in 1967, uh, when he's still at uh, Oxford, he publishes his last great book, Population Growth and Land Use. And here it's more about space uh, and living standards and urban densities and, 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 and spatial economics, not so much about population growth, because he'd, he'd won that argument, he'd won that great debate, I suspect. Uh, and he, he suggested that the, the problems were not so much created by population growth, are not those appalled, but of exceptionally rapid increases in wealth in certain favoured regions of the world, of growing population, their attraction, uh, uh, and their imaginable spread of cities. He's more into sort of, you know, better lifestyles and uh, against urbanization uh, and concentrations of locales. He wanted things to spread out again. He's still into this decentralization. He didn't want huge. Uh, conglomerates of urban and industry in one in focal in, fo in focused areas. You want things to spread out. So he's very much just a, a regional spatial economist. So the real problem wasn't resources or food; it was space for leisure, amenity, and good living, and all in the bid to, to avoid unseemly urbanization. He detests urban sprawl, and in fact, of all the Australian cities, the one that basically meets his criteria would be Canberra, where you've got four or five townships with green belts in between them and highways and a good transport system. So Canberra would be his model metropolis, even though he opposed the centralization that Canberra imposed upon Australia. Anyway, eventually Clark gets back to Australia in 1970, and it's thanks to the Catholic Church, Archbishop James Knox of Melbourne and Santa Maria, of course, who pulls the strings, uh, and he comes back still believing he's got something to offer. He's given a, an honorary gig at Monash University, but it's, it's an unpaid gig, unpaid job. Um, he's now leading a, a think tank for seven years called the Institute of Economic Progress, which is funded by the Catholic Church, which is very near Monash, it's just across the road. And in 1971, he's writing opinion pieces for a leading Australian newspaper chain. He has the audacity to take on great... Jermaine Greer in 1971 on abortion. So he obviously hasn't changed his Edwardian views about uh, the role of women in society. He says, women's rights are men's lefts. And this is a direct quote from his father, his dad. So he obviously hasn't really reformed his view on, on women, even though he now has a daughter, eight boys and one daughter. Um, he's... He now finds an, an, another target to take on, apart from the Malthusians. He now takes on the Club of Rome and the United Nations, who believe we're running out of resources, et cetera. You know, we're going to run out of tin and silver and rubber, et cetera. And again, Clark, very optimistic chap. He's upbeat that man can save himself. Remember, he was a chemist uh, by recycling. And if he tells his children, look, if you want a nice environment, you have to pay for it. You have to use carbon taxes, pollution taxes, whatever. OK. So he, he, he believes we can solve these problems. And he, he's very much into this because he was actually a bushwalker. He liked to go around walking in Australia, camping in Britain, tramping. He liked the, 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 the national estate. He was into that. Uh, you know, Pagu had been one of his uh, books that he'd read as a young man. So he, he's, he's, he's interested in the environment. Uh, he wants to preserve it. Um, and he even says that we can't continue to burn fossil fuels, uh, but he's wary of climate change. Nor does he ever admit, nor did he ever admit that rampant population growth 
would have a negative impact upon the environment. That is one thing he would not say. One thing he would not say. Whether he would accept climate change today, I don't know. If, it, if the empirics were presented to him, the data, he might have changed it. But, but Len, in the late 1980s, he's still skeptic about the greenhouse effect. And he visits Catholic schools in the 1970s, and one of which was mines. And he's still ranting and raging about the negative zeitgeist and the, the negative uh, uh, spirit of all the times cultivated by the Club of Rome uh, and in, in the environmental lobby. He's by nature an optimist. So coming to the end of my little presentation, in 1978, Clark leaves Monash and he leaves the Institute of Economic Progress, which has run out of funding. And he goes back to Queensland. He goes back to his old country house on the Brisbane River, up from the city, way, way up from the, the Br Brisbane when it was... Um, you know, countryside. Now, of course, it's surrounded by urban estates. And in fact, the estate was sold a few years ago for some six million. And the, the Clark family benefited. The reason why is because Clark never sold his Brisbane house when he first bought it in 19, uh, 1940 something. He, he, he bought it. And that's where he used to live when he was in Brisbane, working as a public servant. He never sold it when he went off to England. He missed out in another Nobel Prize in 1984, when his student, Richard Stone, won it for his contributions to economic science, again, that was a terrible injustice, perhaps. And perhaps it was more due to a negligence and ignorance by the Swedish Prize Academy more than anything. Um, Clark was probably more right than he was wrong. And even though his misogynism puts people off and his views on the role of women, uh, embarrassing that he never reformed there, you know, he, 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 want, he wanted to be listened to, okay? He didn't receive many prizes in his life, but we can say, where was Clark right and where was he wrong? Well, he was right about Australia's destiny, even way back in the 19, late 30s, about Australia basically going back to comparative advantage as a primary sector exporter and service economy. He was right about the concerns about the importance of space and amenity. Because when you watch the daily news, it's always a complaint about urban sprawl and suburbs eating into more parkland, et cetera, and people complaining. And I, when I see these stories, I always think of Clark. That's what it was about. People complaining about the encroachment of industry and, you know, suburban estates eating up more grassland or more of the natural estate. So whenever I see that, I always think of Clark. He was right about big government and high taxes and centralized bureaucracy. He was right about high taxation feeding into stagflation in the 1970s. It was an idea that led to Margaret Thatcher appointing him as a, an economic advisor for a few years. He was right about the neo-Malthusian spectrum. And he showed some appreciation uh, of moving away from carbon fuels by admitting that we couldn't continue to burn carbon. And last but not least, he anticipated the great neoliberal revival in economic political thought. In fact, you could say that he was ahead of Hayek and Friedman. Funny thing is, he didn't actually join the Mont Pelerin Society. He, he felt they were too extreme. So he, 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 would ha he had some limitations. And then last but not least, I spent two pages on my reviewers. And what I've done there is um, when the book came out, I decided I would organize the review myself because... My publisher, Springer, would just send out electronic copies and reviewers like to get the real thing. So I made sure that leading journals would be given copies of the book by buying the book and then sending it to the book review editor. And so some of those some of those reviewers have written. And it's a wonderful thing to read what reviewers think. For instance, Hagen Kramer in the European Journal of HGT was basically amounts to be surprised aspects of Clark life. And that theme about a forgotten economist is repeated by a number of them. Claire Wright, Australian Economic History Review, she had a little bit go of my um, chapter flow. That's all right. Uh, it was, as I said, it was hard to write this book because a lot of the, 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 um, a lot of the literature, a lot of the uh, archives have been ruined. For a quick example, Clark never did a CV of his, of his career. He never he never had a bibliography of all the articles he wrote. You had to do that all by yourself. He wasn't into that sort of stuff. David Kilchrist said the book's well organized. And 
vents a frankly selfish nature of Clark's personality. And he's dead right there. Clark was a, well, he, he was a good father, but a shocking husband because he would do all this empirical work at home when the kids are running riot and the wife is running after the kids. You know, he felt that was his, that was her job. His job was just to do his work. So he was, was quite selfish and, and gallivanting around the world by himself, you know, talking in South America and Asia, Japan, by himself. I mean, I had a look at his passports. He was one of the first globetrotting economists, but his wife really came. And so she was dragged out to Australia, then dragged back to England and dragged back to Australia. In fact, when, when they went back to Australia in 1970, she didn't want to go back. She wanted to stay in England. She was quite happy in Oxford. So the, the poor wife... Bruce Littleboy wrote a very perceptive uh, review too, and actually all the reviews did, saying, reminding me that, you know, his proto-liberal views, uh, yeah, but maybe there was an anti-Catholic establishment within Australian academia at the time, um, and that Clark's views were no, no more extreme than white Australia, post-war industrialization, cradle to grave welfare, and Elix global views of views on global doom, that Clark's views weren't all that extreme. And then last slide, John King in a forthcoming review basically says I was too easy easy on Clark. Maybe I was. That's too sympathetic an account. Maybe I was. But and he, he also makes a key point that in this age of global warning, I wonder if Clark would still be in favor of you know, population growth let, letting rip William Coleman from the History of Economics Review, again, another thoughtful review, basically says what he has trouble with finding what was Clark's compass, of course, for his, for his life, because uh, he was an inconsistent contrarian. I think that's dead right. Uh, and again, this conversion to Catholicism mystifies. It mystifies me. Clark said very little about it. Coleman suggests that maybe it was the in Brisbane, the public service, was swamped with Catholics as the uh, uh, public service and also the higher level of the public service. And they may have been a key individual here. And there was a key individual. A Jesuit priest was the one who basically got Clark to recant to the Catholic Church. But we know very little about the spiritual crisis. Uh, and then what was Clark's significance uh, to the current profession? A crude theorist, a gadfly, a question mark. John Tang and the Australian Book Review basically says that maybe why did I spend all this time writing Clark's book when and trying to rehabilitate him, given his rather dated contributions on environment and his acronistic personal views on the role of women. And then last but not least, when you write a book, uh, you come across a little snippets of information about, geez, I wish I had that when, when um, I was writing this book. And um, I recently came across this book 1984. It's a book called Understanding Weather and Climate, and it's written by M. Ferguson and C. Clark. And the C. Clark is none other than Colin Clark. It was written in 1984. And there is a, a, an item in the glossary item about, um, uh, there is a, an a, entry in the glossary item about uh, greenhouse um, climate change, not, not climate change, but the greenhouse effect, as it's now called, climate change is now. And if you go to it, I don't know if Clark wrote this page, but they basically say that it hasn't yet been verified. This book was written in 84. And it said by the year 2000, we'll have a clearer view of whether this is a, a clear threat. But in the meantime, uh, what the world wants is more food. Plants need warmth and climate dioxide. So the, the greenhouse effect might increase both of these. So Clark wrote this. I suspect he was still a skeptic but whether he would be a skeptic now if he was still alive with all this avalanche of material saying that we are in a, 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 a climate change world, um, I suspect he may have recanted there. I don't know. Anyway, that's me from now. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, very interesting presentation. If we can just... Uh, call for any questions now. Any questions for Alex? Alex, do you know what Colin taught at UWA? What was that? Col yeah. I think he taught. I think he taught stats. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I did write a little bit on that in the book. It was only for a couple of months, and then the Premier of Queensland offered them this job, and the 
he had to leave early. There's no record in the um, in the archives of you know of staff records of him listed at UWA. I mean, remember had a no. look. Yeah. So good, it's good. a it's a yeah a temporary appointment. You know. Yeah. You had to get and, special special leave from the vice chancellor to go for this job up in Queensland. Yep. Yep. Okay, Ken. Um, I came across Colin Clark a couple of times uh, at Monash when he was a fellow there. I remember he used to come to seminars and I don't have a, a very clear memory of, of him, but what I do remember is that he's a rather lively elderly gentleman. And then later uh, we invited him to give a seminar at the Reserve Bank. That must have been in 1979 or 1980. And, oh, no, sorry, I, I forgot to say, at, at Monash, I, I got the feeling that there was a rather weary reaction to him. Nothing overt, but I got that feeling that uh, uh, people were somewhat cautious of him although Keith Frearson was it was a big fan I remember right. yep uh, could be the the Cambridge connection uh, he would uh, I remember him talking about Clark recounting a story that he was talking to Keynes on the steps of the treasury yes yes one yes. of Frearson's war stories or not 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 war stories one of his uh, uh, anecdotes and but uh, what I was going to say is that one, one of the uh, other uh, recognitions of Clark in Australia is the Colin Clark building at, at, yeah. at UQ, where the economics uh, department is located. So although they didn't give him the vice chancellor's job, they did give him a building. I presume they gave him a building. He didn't uh, bankroll the building. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yes, yeah. I think he's. I think the time they, they gave him that building, the title to that building, he, he long gone. His sons, one of his sons, went for the presentation. Yeah, the Colin, and they also have a Colin Clark Memorial Lecture. So, at the yeah. same place. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation, Alex. John John King. Yeah, in in my review, Alex, I. I took issue with distributivism from a Marxist perspective, because it seemed to me to be calling for the replacement of capitalism by simple commodity production, which would put humanity back centuries, if not millennia. It seemed to be a deeply, profoundly reactionary proposal. Yeah. What's your reaction to it? Uh... I don't, I, I don't, I don't really know. I didn't go into that, as you say in your review. I didn't go into that the, the distributism. I mean, I found that doctrine itself a bit weird. Uh, you know, going to back to medieval rural utopia and all this sort of stuff. As for Marx, I don't think Clark was into Marx that much, was he? No, no, absolutely not. And if he had, yeah. he might have thought twice about distributivism. Yeah. This thing about Hilaire Billock and the Servile State, 1912, he'd read that as a young man. Mm. He obviously had sown some seeds in, in his mind. I mean, he says to Attlee, or when he goes to visit Attlee, in, he'd been secretary to Attlee in the 1930s, and when he goes to visit Attlee in 1947, Attlee says, oh, we, we, we have these um, labour registration places, you know, where people looking for work, etc." And Clark says, oh, he tells his wife, oh, Britain's becoming a command economy and all this sort of stuff. I thought, it's a bit weird, you know. For a man, it used to be a Fabian socialist and we were Keynes. And yeah. one of the reasons why I came out to Australia was because we had some form of unemployment benefit in Queensland, I believe. And we were much more caring about our unemployed than maybe Britain was. So we had better unemployment. We had better statistics in Australia. So anyway. Um, Rod Tyres. Uh, you're muted, I think. Still. Yeah, sorry, yeah. yes, I, I'm now. I'm now. <laughs> uh, I, 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 never, uh, I, I never met uh, uh, Clark myself, but uh, uh, I was an engineering student as, as an undergraduate 
and I was lectured to by one of Clark's sons, Nicholas Clark, um, who was a reserve economist who came and taught engineering students a little bit about economics. Um, uh, and uh, he did emphasize frequently how famous his father was. Um, but uh, I'm wondering, I, mean, I don't know anything about the end of his life. You haven't mentioned that and whether his wife actually survived him. Um, and anything about his, repu his residual reputation in England as distinct from Australia, uh, is he more popularly regarded in England having spent much of his life there um, than, than he has been in Australia? His wife outlived him. Uh, Clark got Parkinson's in the early 80s. Uh, the National Library interviewed him in 1986, but his, his verbal delivery was faltering and the questions that the woman was asking were very poor questions. As for his, um, uh, his recognition, um, he was given four honorary doctorates, one by Melbourne, one by, one by Monash, one by Queensland, one by Tilburg and one by Milan. Nothing in England. And in fact, I think when he died, some of the, there was a Times, there was an obituary in the Times and basically, I think the, the, the thrust of it was that he'd been an unrec you know, was unrecognized in his own country. Mm. Uh, uh, Interesting. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think at least the steward, we, you know, we, we um, did good in giving him an economic society, a distinguished fellow award and naming a building after him and a lecture after him and claiming him as one of our own. Um, so yes, I, I think the reference will probably made up for the um, the ostracism and the um, the um, resentment of him and the and and, and what um, uh, Ken was saying about the Monash is is interesting too. He wasn't paid in that Monash job, and he was there from six from seventy to seventy eight teaching. It's also teaching. So I was pretty poor sure that none of the Australian universities wanted to employ him in the 50s or in the late 60s. But again, as, as I said, maybe it was anti-Catholicism, maybe it was a connection with Santa Maria, his, his unearthly views for all the women, the environment, mm -hmm. when there was people were actually supporting all these causes, etc. Alex, just a question from me. What about beyond Australia and America? Some of the themes that he seemed to be interested in, the neoliberal themes, obviously would resonate in parts of America. The de decentralization and th those sort of things. Has his work been acknowledged or picked up? Or are you aware of his work work's been picked up? Uh, I don't think so. When, when he went when he went back to England, he, he did stop off at Chicago and he was offered a job in Chicago, but he said, This is not the place to raise my family. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't in the faculty of economics. He was a self he corresponded with Milton Friedman. But I don't think his reputation in America he actually found America somewhat distasteful, New York. Um, a noisy place. Yeah. Um, but he, he did, when he went back to Oxford, remember, he, he was going over, to, flying over the Atlantic to help these business corporations on their business forecasting. And he was making a mozza there. Though, again, I don't know how much he actually made. Um, and he was, you know, he'd go off there on lecture tours of the independent colleges and colleges of liberal colleges and giving view, Catholic colleges, etc., and giving graduation addresses. But whether his reverence or his, the memory of him in America is stronger than it is here, I don't know. I don't think it is. I haven't had many American uh, reviewers, actually, of the book. May, the History of Political Economy, I sent them a copy. Whether they review it is another matter. I, Sue, they would probably give Sue House in the job, but she actually read the proofs of the book, as did Stuart McIntyre, so uh, yep. she's conflicted. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, Ken, is that... Uh, an old hand up or you've got a new comment? Oh, no, um, I was just going to say that I think his most durable contribution is uh, the book that you mentioned, the early book that he mentioned, The Conditions of Economic Progress. Th yeah. This is uh, still widely recognised yeah. as a seminal contribution in measurement, measurement economics, measurement yeah. of... Uh, living standards around the world and he did 
one heck of a lot of foundation work on measuring PPPs for uh, yep. a large number of countries that uh, uh, this was undertaken for the first time. And I, and I think that that's uh, uh, well accepted that he was a pioneer in yep. that area. And, and still it's in people's um, memory, uh, yeah. uh, I, I'd say, and probably still, yeah. still referred to in, uh, in that literature. You're quite right. The World Bank did actually nominate him as one of the 10 pioneering economists in development economics. So he got some recognition for that. But yeah, that book is his most highly cited work, probably maybe a, a book that deserved a, a Nobel Prize, but it was overlooked. It was a pioneering book. He, as I said, he wrote half of it in England and half of it in Australia, in Brisbane, uh, while he was working in those three jobs in Brisbane. But yeah, and, and the work on the PPE, PPP, um, yes, uh, it's most highly cited work. Yeah. Enrico, uh, Rico. Thanks. I was just wondering if, if he had much interaction with Bill Phillips, given the again, obvious emphasis on statistics and then that LAC connection mentioned as well. Uh, I don't think he actually uh, got stuck into the Phillips curve, no. No, I don't think he did. Honestly, I, I can't I can't recall anything there. Right. Okay. Remember, Phillips came out here in '58, so Clark was still in England then. But right. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a, a, a lot. Of, a lot. There's a lot of gaps in the story. Even though the book's pretty well written, and it's it's not bad. There's a lot of gaps in the stuff. I mean, the fact that he his papers up at UQ, for instance. They're in a bit of a mess. You, know, the, you, you, you flick over and the letter comes out of the binding and all this stuff because he did it himself. And he did this about in the 80s, 86, 87, when he was stuffing from Parkinson's. And um, apparently a lot of the family correspondence was destroyed. Right. And one of his sons um, was pilfering letters out from the collection up in Brisbane. He was a bit sort of um, warped. Uh, and then he was for, told to give it back, etc. So, but and and Clark's not a very helpful for his biographers because he never had any resume or anything, <laughs> you know, um, no resume, no CV of his job appointments. I, I didn't have his passports from one of his sons, David, who was probably the most helpful in encouraging me to write the book. David Clark, and he, he sent me all his passports so I could track his movements a little bit, um, etc. Where he'd been, which countries he'd been to. He then, 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 of course, you you had a British passport because in the thirties Australians were basically treated as British citizens or British, yeah, British passport issued. So I could track some of his movements. Okay. Well, thank you, Alex. Are there any more? Comments or questions? I suppose the, the curse of being a biographer is you, as I said, with those Gar that Garno revelation, which maybe Ken might want to talk about, that Bob Hawk came visiting De Monash and he saw Clark in the audience and he went, he, he went um, apeshit, so to speak. And that, I mean, that's a lovely story. Uh, and then this book, with, which I, I knew of it, but I couldn't find it. So eventually I thought, oh, well, what about these secondhand booksellers? And I think this came from Britain. It's a British textbook, Understanding Weather and Climate. And we'll see Clark, was that Colin Clark? Because it doesn't say anything. It says, it mentions his name in the in the frontispiece, but it doesn't say where he's from or anything. And I thought, is that, is that our Colin Clark? Yes, it was. Well, Thank you very much, Alex, for bringing a very interesting story to the HAPS network and the economics department at UWA. It's uh, always a pleasure to see the history of economics discussed here. Um, so on behalf of both those groups, um, if we could show our appreciation, it would be good. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank good you. seeing all of you. Yeah, likewise. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye, folks. Yeah. Bye. Thank you.